Now I want to talk to you about something uh, that we cannot disconnect ourselves from. You know, the, the struggle of Islam, of course, is, an, is a timeless struggle. But at the same time, we are living in 2010. And we are living in a context where the Muslims have gone through quite a bit of change in the last hundred years. The last hundred, hundred and fifty years have been a very transformational time for the Ummah. We cannot separate ourselves from our history. Where, how we think, how we understand Islam, where we are today, is a product of a lot of events that have taken place. And if we don't understand those events, and what got us here, then we're not going to be able to understand how to move forward. So uh, very briefly, I'll just mention one thing. Islamic movements over the last 100 to 150 years. In 1924, the last remnant of, of what was an Islamic state falls. This is the Ottoman Empire, of course, right? The Uthmani state. It collapses in 1924. Since then, you have the birth of several movements all over the world, India, the Africas, you know, in the Arab world, that are trying to revive Islam. They're trying to bring Islam back. Right? And writers talked about how there need to be movements and groups that need to bring back. And this, this rhetoric started of developing an Islamic state. So pretty much every major movement in the last 100, 150 years talked about the revival of Khilafah. Bringing Khilafah back. And quoting all the hadith that talk about the Khilafah. And talk, looking at the Sila and saying, look, this is what the Messenger did Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is what we need to do. In other words, tying their struggle directly to the Sira of the Messenger Sallallahu Now in, in one sense that's very good. In the sense that we need to tie our struggle always to the struggle of the Messenger But in one sense, sense this is oversimplification. When we take lessons from the Sira, we cannot ignore the time, the place, and the changes that have taken place. So you cannot copy paste lessons, you have to apply them very carefully. This requires a lot of detailed understanding of the time and place in which you live. And so I want to present to you something that actually uh, uh, one of my, my very dear teachers and colleagues, uh, um, and uh, to me actually an intellectual role model who's a member of this community, Brother Bashir Ansari, uh, wrote uh, in Al Jazeera. He wrote an article in Al Jazeera, uh, Al Islamiyun Bayna Dawla Wala Dawla. I thought it was fantastic, really. I, I, I studied it with him when I took it with me to Detroit, and I thought it was just absolutely stunning, this article. And I hope to actually get it translated and, and make it available to you guys. And the, the, the subject of the article was Islamists, meaning Islamic movements, caught between having a state and not having a state. Right, this idea of statehood. In other words, two things became equation. Establishment of deen equals establishment of a state. This idea was made common. If you want to establish the deen, you have to have a government. You have to have a state. I don't mean New Jersey, I mean like a government state. Okay? It lies in statehood. So, this idea is actually what he questions. And he says, what are the roots of this idea and what are the problems with this idea? First of all, most of the movements that called for a state have had no experience or idea or know-how how to run a state. What does it take to run a government? Sanitation, police, road maps, taxation, right? Huge bureaucracy. I mean, if you work in a big company with 500 employees plus, Governments are the biggest kinds of organizations in existence. They're the, the most colossal organization with the most number of employees. It is a massive, massive bureaucracy. So you have a movement that says, we should have an Islamic state, we should have this and that and the other. But they don't have even close to the road map to what it takes to build a complex state. You cannot compare that to the, the life in Medina. Medina was simple, easy. These people didn't need governments and a water department and a taxation department and a you know, municipality. And they didn't need these things. They just had simple hut homes. And they were living in tribal lives. Now they're a little bit more organized. A very, it's a very preliminary form of a state that the Messenger established. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For that society was very advanced. But compared to what we have now, it's very simple. So to say, we're just gonna go establish and say, if you give these movements, let's say, you know what, we're ready to give you the state. Here. Here, take Pakistan. Take it. Take, take, you can have it. What are they going to do? How are they going to run it? Do they have the credentials to actually budget, to, to, to finance a budget, to engage in you know, policing and things like that? They don't. They don't have the wherewithal. These are things that require a high degree of expertise. And by the way, let me tell you something else that, was, that he mentioned in the article that to me was mind-blowing. 
a movement. When Muslims are trying to say, Muslims need to wake up, and we need to stand up, and we need to establish the deen, these are the kinds of things I can give in a khutbah, and people might say, Takbir! Right? Everybody's gonna, yeah! Iqamat al-deen! But, but, so movements can fire people up. They can, they, can, they can invigorate people, they can inspire people. People can read the works of people like Maududi rahimahullah, or Sayyid Qutb rahimahullah, and to this day be moved, right? And be like, you know, or Mulana Ilyas rahimahullah. These people, they can read them and say, wow, that's amazing stuff, you know? But, tell me which country in the world today looks at its government and say, they are so awesome. I love those guys in government. You know what comes with being in government? What naturally comes with being in government? Being hated. You can't avoid it. People have a natural tendency to not be inspired, especially not be inspired by their government. And some places in the world, these groups figured it out. I'll give you an example, not because I condone them, because we need to understand the political science of this. You have a group like Hezbollah. Now there's efforts made in, in Lebanon to enter them into politics, right? They want to bring them into the political realm. But the leadership of Hezbollah says, no thanks, we don't want government. You know why? Because when they're outside of government, a lot of people love them. <laughs> but if they enter government, what's going to happen? They're going to lose their credit. Oh, they're corrupt like all these other government politicians. You see what I'm saying? So they understand that they are more powerful outside government than they even are inside government. Now let's not just take a, a, an Arab example, let's take an American example. How much does government affect your life? On a day-to-day -day basis, okay, I know you pay taxes every year. I understand that. But other than that, on a daily basis, what influence does government have on your life? The major things that are in this country, for example, the, the way you think about fashion, the way you think about what's success and failure, your mentality, you know it doesn't come from the government. It all comes from the private sector. It comes from the entertainment industry, and the academia, and the major corporations that are selling products to us, and running, the, driving the advertising, and, the, and the, all, even the medical research, and you know, all the research in universities funded by private organizations. In other words, the vast majority of things that influence you on a day-to-day -day basis, don't come from government. Where do they come from? Well, what I like to call the private sector. They come from the private sector. If Muslims understood that, you know what we would be worried about? If you really want to take over society, you know what you should be taking over? The private sector. Open field. The Muslims haven't even begun to touch the, how many Muslims in media. More powerful than government today is what? The media can change the, the course of elections. The media can get a president impeached. The media can do crazy things. The media can say things like horrible, terrible things like Obama's Muslim. <laughs> And get away with it. Media is powerful. Academia, universities. Universities shape the minds of the, 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 the pillars of this society. How many Muslims in academia? How many Muslim sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists, historians? We're not present. We came to this country and we thought success is doctor, engineer. Okay, fine, you couldn't do doctor, engineer, programmer, right? Uh, you know, I, uh, IT, right? Or, okay, if none of those worked out, gas station, <laughs> right? <So. laughs> this was success for us. If we make good money, if we can buy a nice house, if we can live in a nice neighborhood, we've got success. This is success for an individual, maybe. For a community, look at what, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, baffled by the Jewish community. I'm, I'm amazed by them. You know why? Because when they first came to this country, they were treated like we are treated now. And you know what they got themselves, you could say, oh, they're, they're riba people, whatever. But you know what they, what they really got themselves into? Not just financial institutions. Entertainment, literature, academics, virtually any major university in, in, in the country, a significant proportion of the faculty is Jewish. That's a norm. That's, it just, it's normal, you know. So they became the deep fabric of this country. So it's so much so that they're untouchable. Muslims didn't. We just become, we became skilled labor. That's all we are. Even if you're a doctor, even if you're an engineer, in the end, you're just a highly skilled worker. You're not, a, you're not someone who influences minds or, or causes ripples in society. You, you're not. 
You know, you're just a con uh, you're just a better consumer, so you buy a more expensive car. So I guess you're adding to the economy a little bit, but you're not a mover and shaker. You're not an influencer of minds. You understand? So Muslims, we have to understand to penetrate the society, we need to enter the private sector. To enter the private sector, we need to be in major positions in universities all over this country. We need to be actually funding. You know, Islamic studies program at the University of Chicago is funded by a Jewish group. What do you think that they're gonna, what kind of research they're gonna produce? Which Islamic studies program at the PhD level is being funded by Muslim organizations? There's one attempt being made in, in Detroit with, the, with, with you know, uh, uh, I think in, in Troy, Michigan. And they're asking for an endowment of a couple of million and the Muslims are struggling to come up with those money. I appreciate their effort actually. If you're not entering into the, this is the game. You gotta enter the game. You know the messenger challenges the poets. The poets of our time are the academics. You gotta enter the game. You know, we're not even in it. We're just, we're bubbled uh, by ourselves. So this is a very big thing that we need to enter. We need to have our Muslim youth that are creative go into media studies, go into film production. This is the language of our, this is the poetry of our time. You know, the, the thing that moved the masses in the time of the messenger was poetry. What moves us today is YouTube. Right? We need people that are actually qualified in film production, sociologists. Psy you know, not just psychologists, but, but even like historians, Muslim historians, we need them. We don't have them. We don't have, these are things that become the fabric of a society. And the other thing we need is huge, massive Walmart sized businesses. Not just run by individuals, but they're these massive, massive organizations that are funding entire like projects. So for example, I'll give you a secular example like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation from, you know, from Microsoft, right? They give so many endowments to schools across the country and help out and things like that. Muslims need to have institutions like that. That don't just help Muslim institutions, they help America in general. They help America at large. Why should we do this? Because then we become a fabric of this society. We become, they, they can't talk about us like they do now. They talk about us now as though we're like these uh, wild dogs let loose in the society. Literally, that's how we're talked about in the media. There's no, we're not given human dignity when we're talked about. That's not, that's not where we stand. Why not? Because we isolated ourselves. We, we, we did that to us.